Hello, welcome, come in, have a seat. Let's get started, shall we? Time is money. So I'm going to show you some things and I want you to just tell me the first thing that comes to mind and I'm going to take notes on what you say. So, what do you see in this image? Okay, and in this one? What about this one? I see. Interesting. Well, it appears that you are interested in learning more about what the heck these things are and how they're used in psychology. So let's get started, shall we? This video made possible thanks to viewers and patrons like you. Thanks. Hi, welcome back to the channel. Today we are doing the first half of another patron topic pick. The first half because I'm apparently still figuring out how much I can actually bite off in one video. If you would like to vote on future patron topic picks, check out my Patreon. In addition to voting, you'll also get access to the monthly live streams, behind the scenes stuff, other things as they get added in the future. Oh, special flair on Discord. Speaking of, you can also find me on Discord, Twitter, surprisingly, in the comment section of these videos. So yeah, links for everything are in the description box or the comment section. In this first half, we are going to go through some things to keep in mind with psychological testing, discuss some of the psychological tests used to measure personality, and a quick definition of what personality is. In the second half, we'll actually talk about personality psychology and astrology. Ooh. So let's begin at the beginning. All right, so let's start with some basics of psychological testing before getting into the personality stuff. A psychological test is some standardized measure of a sample of a person's behavior. We'll unpack some of that definition in a second, but first let me just add that there are two big categories of psych tests. One category are the personality tests, which we'll get to in this video, and the other category are the mental ability tests. These include intelligence tests, like the Wisconsin Adult Intelligence Scale or the Wisconsin Intelligence Scale for Children, the standardized tests for college and grad school admissions, so the SAT, ACT, or the GRE, are also mental ability tests. All right, this has come up on the channel a few times before, but some concepts bear repeating. Standardization, reliability, and validity. Standardization is when you have a new person's test results that you compare against a pre-test group. Basically, you have some existing data set of people who've taken this test previously that you use almost as a grading key for that new person. An easy illustration of this is with babies and growth percentiles. There's a ton of established data, which is sort of like a pre-test group, for babies' weights and heights, which I guess we call length at that age. Makes sense. You go in with your baby, their measurements are taken and compared against the developmental norms for that age. This can indicate if the baby is developing normally or if there's something that should be looked into. Similar to child growth, a common underlying assumption for the stuff we're measuring is that the results will roughly fit a normal distribution. In a testing context, a normal distribution is one that has the majority of people having a score nearish the average and the proportion of people falling off as the scores go more extreme. Weight, height, intelligence, and personality traits are some things that will roughly fit a normal distribution. An actual testing example now. The GRE, or graduate record exam, is the standardized test you have to take if you're trying to apply to grad school, at least in the US. And if you haven't taken this test, there's a writing thing, and then there's five chunks of verbal and math stuff. Why five? While you're taking the test for yourself, the test makers are piloting questions for future tests. One section is entirely this and won't factor into your score, but you don't know which section is that test pilot section. In this piloting, they're figuring out which questions work and which ones don't, but they're also forming a new standardized data set for that future test. After all, how do we know whether a question is hard or easy? In the case of standardized tests, we know which questions are hard and easy because we have data. The hard questions, a subset will get right, and the easy questions, most people will get right. And when I was teaching, I definitely included A-breakers on my tests. These would be the questions that I expected 
75% of the class to get wrong. This is what makes the A or breaks the A. Another aspect of standardization is that the tests be given in equivalent controlled conditions. So you could expect a person trying to take the SAT, let's say, in the middle of construction area is going to score differently than if they were taking it in a quiet classroom setting. Relevant to personality, we want to know that the person taking the test is giving the truest representation of themselves. If they're taking it drunk or high, they might be responding differently than if they were sober. And if we're trying to get a measure of their personality when sober, it would be useful to have them be sober when they're taking the test. Reliability is how consistent the test is with repeated measurements. Conceptually, you want to know that if you gave the same person the same test over and over and over again, they would get the same results. So practically, it doesn't quite work this way, especially with some cognitive things, because we have to worry about people learning the test. But for personality tests, that's less of an issue. There's a couple ways to establish if a test is reliable or not. In all instances we're going to talk about, the test maker would be checking the correlation between the two instances. And so what you want to see is the low scoring people getting a low score both times and the high scoring people getting a high score both times. One is to have people repeatedly take the test. This is known as test retest reliability because sometimes the best name is also the most boring. In split half reliability, the questions within a single test are split in half. Let's say the even and odd questions on an academic test. So going up a level, instead of looking at one person's ability to take the test, you now look at the ability of the people scoring it to be consistent. This is known as inter-rater reliability, and if there's good reliability here, it means that the different people scoring it should yield the same results. Last is validity. Are we measuring what we think we're measuring? And there are several facets to this. Content validity is concerned with if we're measuring the behavior, we say we're measuring. So if we have a test of attention or irritability or anger or something, and all we gather are shoe size, it's probably not a valid test. Predictive validity is concerned with if the test is able to actually predict what it says it can. So the ACT, SAT, all of those standardized tests that you have to take if you want to go to college, the reason you're taking that is because it's supposed to be able to predict how well you will do in college. Each school only has so many slots for students each year, and so they need to know that they are going to admit the students who have the greatest likelihood of succeeding. So they also get GPA, but GPA can vary between schools. For example, at my high school, I graduated with a greater than 4.0 GPA. I mean, they gave us a 5 instead of a 4 if we got an A in honors or AP classes, so that's where that came from. But anyways, I had a higher than 4.0 GPA. Other schools, somebody who's an equivalent student to me, might only have a 3.9 or a 4. So comparing between schools can be difficult, especially if there's grade inflation at some places. So you have the standardized test where everybody takes it, it's the same test, you know how it works, and so you can use those two measures to see which students they want to admit. Lastly, when we're measuring a construct of some form, so constructs are things like working memory, attention, or intelligence, is the test actually measuring that construct? A lot of psychological testing needs to be careful here because of the nature of what we're studying. We don't have the luxury of a field like physics where you can measure an actual physical thing. It's relatively obvious when you're trying to measure the length of something with the number of good vibes it gives off that you're not actually measuring the length. It can be trickier in psych to know if you're doing something similar. And on that note, on to personality. Personality can be roughly defined as a person's characteristic pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting. But how do we operationalize personality? How do we take it from a general sense or feeling that we have about ourselves and others and turn it into something that will meet those criteria that I just bored you all with? Psychology. There's a reason why my examples for the reliability and friends were all more on the cognitive end of things than the personality psych. Trying to quantify personality is no simple task, for sure. Measuring something like intelligence is no walk in the park by any stretch of the imagination, and the construct of intelligence is certainly contentious. But 
trying to derive a cohesive theory for why people behave the way they do, and not just explain the full range of possibilities, but make predictions about factors that cause different personality types, it's a lot. That's part of why it's its own field within psychology. Although there is a fair bit of overlap with industrial organizational or IO psychology and counseling. All right, so how do we measure personality? There are two broad categories for the types of personality tests that are typically done. Inventories and projective tests. Personality inventories are almost like professional versions of the dreaded BuzzFeed quizzes. A bunch of questions are asked of the person taking the test, either by filling out the test themselves or a person giving them the test. A quick example of a personality inventory is the 10 item personality inventory, or the TIPI for short. With the TIPI, you have a Likert scale ranging from 1, strongly disagree, to 7, strongly agree, and you rate yourself on the 10 items. This will make more sense when we get to the theory video, but the TIPI is seeing where people fit on the Big Five model of personality. Another commonly used test is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. The MMPI is much longer than 10 items, like over 300 items longer. Instead of a Likert scale like with the TIPI, for each item, you would simply respond true, false, or cannot say, or possibly leave it blank depending on the format of the test. The MMPI tends to be more for personality or psychological problems, anything from antisocial personality disorder, anxiety, substance abuse, to family problems. A cool thing built into the MMPI are the validity scales. These are checks built into the test to try and catch if the person isn't answering honestly. Basically, some questions are asked more than once, but with slightly different phrasings. If you're not answering truthfully and honestly, these can trip you up. And that is how you fail a personality test. These types of personality tests involve the use of self-report. What this means is that we basically are asking the person what they think of themselves. And this is a bit of a mixed blessing. So on the one hand, the person taking the test, in theory, should know themselves the best, and so should be the greatest authority to answer this test. On the other hand, the person might not answer entirely truthfully for various reasons. They might be trying to answer in a more socially acceptable way and kind of downplay or hide their less good traits, or they might not really have a good read on themselves accurately. They might think they are the nicest, sweetest person in the world, when in reality, they're actually a Karen. A definite upside with the personality inventories is that because these tests are basically multiple choice, there isn't room for the test scores, biases, or interpretations to come into play. To bring this back to the first chunk of the video, because of how these tests are typically developed, the personality inventories will have some degree of standardization. A large number of people are tested in the development period and through statistical magic. The items that load onto the different personality traits for whatever theory the test is for drop out. The reliability of the inventories will somewhat depend on the person taking the test and their mood or other transient states, but for the most part, a well-designed test should be reliable in the results that are produced. Finally, these tests will be put through the scientific ringer to make sure that they're actually measuring the different constructs or characteristics that they say they are. As such, the tests that stand the test of time a bit are pretty valid, at least for our current understanding of personality. Projective tests don't rely on self-report like the inventories do. Instead, they try to get out a person's personality through how the person reacts to ambiguous stimuli. An assumption of these types of tests is that subconscious features that the person is either trying to hide or might not be aware of will be projected onto the stimuli, which can then be revealed through the interpretation of the results by the test giver. So an example you might be familiar with from pop culture is the Rorschach ink block test. In this test, the person is shown a series of ink blots and asked what they see in two phases. In the first phase, it's just the person responding to the ink blots. And in the second, the ink blots are shown again, but in a set order. The person is asked to expand on what they saw and why they see what they see. Everything the person does or says is noted. If they ask permission to do something, if they rotate the cards, everything. There are different scoring systems for how to interpret the responses. Generally, the things the person sees in the card and how they interact with it are thought to indicate different features of the person's personality or things they might be struggling with. Another projective test is the Thematic Apperception Test, or TAT for short. In this test, the person is asked to make up stories about ambiguously drawn scenes that they are shown. If some element of the story isn't given by the person, they could be prompted with things like, who are the people? 
What's happening? What brought this scene to this moment? What's going to happen next? There are 32 total scenes possible, but most practitioners will only use a subset. It's usually assumed that the person telling the story will identify with the main character in the scene, and so things that they are saying in the story for that main character are reflective of themselves in some way. So the projective tests do sort of sidestep this issue of self-reporting. The person isn't being asked about their personality or to talk about themselves, so that's not an issue. However, a whole other can of worms does open up here. Because the answers to these questions aren't multiple choice like in the personality inventories, but are instead open-ended and can include the behaviors the person is doing while they're taking the test, there's a lot of room for interpretation here. And kind of funny, but it can even include the biases of the test giver and scorer being projected onto the test taker. Not objectively cute. Testing concept loopback time. So? There is some standardization happening with these tests in that the ambiguous stimuli used are consistent between the different test administrators, so that's good. But it kind of falls apart a bit because how these tests are administered can vary greatly between people giving the test. And it's even to the point where with the TAT, some people will only give a subset of the cards instead of all of them, so that's not good. Interrater reliability, so the degree to which different people scoring the test will give the same answer or not, leaves much to be desired. Likewise, test retest reliability could also be better. You won't see much serious use of these tests outside of the depth psychologists. So that's an umbrella term for psychologists who approach things from a psychoanalytic or a psychodynamic approach. If you've been around my channel for a bit, hopefully you remember that the psychoanalytic approach is Freud's baby, and the psychodynamic approach is mostly Jung's. I bring this up now because the validity of the projection tests hang on the validity of the theories that they're based on. Proponents of these tests argue that the concepts of reliability and validity don't necessarily apply to projective tests. So, yeah. I saved one test for last because it's a rather contentious odd duck. And I say it's an odd duck because it's not included in my psychometrics test book, for one. And it behaves like a personality inventory in that you have a bunch of items that you have to rate yourself on, so multiple choice. But it's based on one of the less scientifically rigorous personality theories. I am speaking of the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, or the MBTI, or the Myers-Briggs for short. The Myers-Briggs was designed by Briggs and her daughter Myers in an attempt to help women find work that would fit their needs, desires, personality, whatever, post-World War II. There is some overlap with Jung's personality dichotomies, but there are unique types that weren't in Jung's work. When you take the Myers-Briggs, each question will only load on one of these dichotomies. At the end, you will get a score for each of the dichotomies, with the score translating to which end of the dichotomy you prefer. That's why those grids of the personality types mashed up with pop culture things have 16 boxes to fill. I'll mention that it does get a bit more complicated than the 16 boxes, with how strong the preference is, which type is dominant, but that's a bit deeper than I want to go in this video. As with the previous tests, let's talk about how the Myers-Briggs is on those testing concepts from the beginning of the video. So, for administration and scoring, the Myers-Briggs is pretty good for standardization. It's a set test with set questions and they're multiple choice, so the scoring is completely straightforward and the interpretation just sort of falls out of the test. But there is an issue here. If people are supposed to have a type preference for each dichotomy, we would expect that the combined population data would fit a bimodal distribution. Two humps, not one hump. But that's not what's found. For the different dimensions, people tend to fall into the normal distribution, with only a subset falling into the stronger preference ends. The reliability isn't the best, with people's types tending to change more often than not, especially with greater periods of time. And then there's the issue of validity. The introversion-extroversion dichotomy does seem to correlate with other measures of that trait, but the others do not. Plus, there's that whole issue of this test being built on Jung's theory of personality, which I've argued in the past isn't that great scientifically. Alrighty. Now that you have some of the basics for how we go about measuring personality, you should be all set for talking about the different theories or approaches of personality. Which is going to happen in a separate video. It's like those book adaptations where they take the last book in the series and split it into like two movies, 
but instead of doing that to maximize profits, I'm doing it to make sure I can get a video out this week. So until next time, bye.